Welcome back. We're looking at Darwin's legacy and whether or not his theory of evolution can coexist comfortably with religion. And don't forget, we take your calls on this show, and you can reach us at the numbers at the bottom of your screen. Well, we're glad to have with us a man known for his direct views on this subject. From Oxford, we join Richard Dawkins, evolutionary biologist and popular science writer. He holds the Charles Simoni Chair for the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford. Professor Dawkins is the author of the top-selling book, The God Delusion, which has already been translated into more than 30 languages. Professor Dawkins, welcome to the show. Thank you. Sir, I was interested to read uh, in, in your writings how you believe one of the big issues, one of the big problems that occurs with evolution uh, and the, the controversial debate about it is that many people don't actually understand the concept of evolution fully. Explain that to me. Yes, a lot of people think it's a theory of chance. They say, I can't believe that sheer chance could put together something as complicated as a dog or a human or, or an ape. And the answer, of course, is that it didn't, uh, because natural selection is the precise opposite of chance. That, I think, is the biggest misunderstanding, and it's quite lamentably common. Almost all the opposition that you hear to evolution is because people think it's a theory of chance. And if it really was a theory of chance, well, then any fool can see it wouldn't work. Now, sir, I know you're not happy with the way uh, schooling handles the subject of evolutionary science. Um, how would you propose it, its handle? I know you, you feel it's just, certainly in America at least, and perhaps in a lot of the Western world, not covered thoroughly enough. Yes, in Britain too. I think it doesn't start early enough. It's actually not that difficult to understand, although you wouldn't guess that. Um, I believe you could start by teaching eight-year-olds about the idea. It isn't that difficult to understand, and it's really rather tragic that children are taught what actually amounts to nonsense. I mean, myths can be quite beautiful, but it, it is actually wrong, and we do know what the truth is nowadays. And the truth is enthralling, it's beautiful, it's elegant. And so it's such a shame that children miss out on that. And there's no reason why it should be left into the middle teen years, which at least in Britain I think it is, uh, rather than being taught really early, when children are questioning, when they want to know the answer to questions. Now, of course, I know it's not as simple as a debate between religion and, and science, um, though it's often portrayed that way, but do you feel there is a place, I mean, personally, do you feel there is a place for religion in society? Uh, not really, no. I mean, obviously, people are entitled to believe whatever they like, but I don't think there's any evidence for religious belief. You can argue quite separately over whether religion has beneficial effects on morality and society, but... I, as a scientist, I see religion primarily as a set of claims about existence. There's the existence of a super, supernatural, supreme, creative being. I think that that is actually wrong, but of course that's a matter to be argued about. I can't dictate that by fiat. Is there, is there room for spirituality then? I mean, do you differentiate between spirituality and, and religion? Yes, I mean, I think that's a very good point. And, and if you use spirituality to mean love of poetry, love of music, being moved by nature, looking up at the stars and getting a catch in your throat, that kind of spirituality, of course, I have and other atheistic scientists have. Uh, but that does not imply a belief in anything supernatural. Let me put an email to you, sir, that we got from uh, Hilal al-Shandudi in Oman. And there are a viewer in Oman says, I think that Darwin's theory is nonsense because everything has a beginning. So where did these cells originally come from? There must be a creator who created everything. So again, this is an issue that's often raised. How do you get around that, that debate about point of origin? It's really rather silly, isn't it? Because it leaves open the question of where the creator came from. You haven't explained anything at all if you simply invoke a creator to say, where do the first cells come from or where does the first atoms uh, come from? That won't do that kind of explanation. Actually, it's much worse an explanation to say that there's a creator because the creator would have to be a great, big, intelligent, complicated thing, which is the very kind of thing that we in science are trying to explain and to a very large extent succeeding. We have another email I'd like to put to you from the Philippines this time. We've got the viewers from around the world involved in this, of course. Valdemar uh, Tamayo says, let's forget all religions, they block progress. Now, I wonder, if, is there any evidence that when, when communities move away from religion, as happens in, in many cases, that there is a tendency for them to, to move towards belief in evolution, or is there no necessarily any no link between the two? Oh, I bet there's a link between the two. But your, your caller from the Philippines was talking about progress and you and we were talking about societies which have which have largely abandoned religion I mean I think of for example the Scandinavian societies which seem to have largely abandoned religion and they are very civilized societies I mean they're, they're societies in which people are on the whole are happy well cared for um, but that's a different 
point from the one that you were raising, right. which is to do with evolution. I'm, I'm sure there's an inverse correlation between belief in evolution and belief in, in religion, if that's what you're asking. Well, I, I'm wondering, as a species, what do you feel we're doing to ourselves as a species, as humans, um, by, by effectively intervening with natural selection through the use of medicines, through the use of artificial body parts, keeping ourselves alive where perhaps nature would have said, your time's up? Yes, I mean, that undoubtedly must be going on. I'm all for it. I mean, I don't want to retreat to a Darwinian world. As I've often said, I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to explaining why we exist. That's, that's the truth. But I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to organizing society. So I definitely do not want to abolish doctors and abolish penicillin, abolish antibiotics, abolish vaccination. Far from it. Well, I've got to get a caller on the line from Scotland. Abdul, uh, Abdul has a question. Go ahead, Abdul. Uh, hello, Riz. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Abdul Rahman. Uh, just, it, Abdul Rahman, it wasn't thanks. really a comment. It, 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 was just, it was more of a comment than a question. Sure. Uh, it's just basically what your previous caller said ab about being a Muslim and believing in evolution. I mean, this is quite clearly wrong. You know, we, we know in Islam that we came from Adam, peace be upon him. And Adam was created as a man. He was not created as a monkey or a transitional form. You know, now, in, in terms of my belief, uh, you know, the Islamic belief is that we came from... Um, Adam, peace upon him, and you know, evolution is quite clearly wrong. And if you look at what evolution has done, the theory of evolution, I mean, you, you can say that the Second World War, in, in, in effect, came about because of this belief in, in, in Darwinian theory that, you know, the, it's the survival of the fittest. So, I mean, really, if we do not believe in the Supreme Being, I mean, you know, look at the chaos these other theories w will, will take us to. Okay. Uh, Professor Dawkins, you must, get the, you must get these kind of points made to you quite regularly. Um, that your caller is um, entitled to his belief in Adam. It is, however, false. Um, the evidence is absolutely clear. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as for the point about the Second World War, I don't know what he's talking about there. You could say that in conditions of warfare, that could be an example of survival of the fittest. I doubt if one could ob object to that. However, <laughs> it's an absolute nonsense to say that it's because of Darwinism, because of natural selection, that the Second World War happened. I mean, that's just simply... Um, illogical thinking. Now, I know you're not a big fan of uh, intelligent design, the, the, the sort of the phrase that's come up more recently, especially in the debate on, on how religion and creationism should be taught. Now, I wonder what do you see as the main problem with the whole ID concept? Well, uh, intelligent design is not different from creationism. It's a political ploy to try to get around certain American laws. So there's no difference. You shouldn't dis differentiate between them. Both of them believe that life, especially life, is too complicated to have come about uh, without a, a designer. Um, what they overlook is firstly that the evidence for evolution is extremely strong and secondly that if you do postulate a designer you haven't explained anything because as I said earlier you're left needing an explanation for the designer. Therefore using a designer to explain ultimate things is to have explained absolutely nothing. It's a total non-starter as an explanation. I'd love to get your perspective, Professor Dawkins, on, on if you've given this thought, on how we as a species might look, perhaps, uh, if we can look that far ahead, a million years down, down the line. I mean, seeing, you know, uh, uh, going along the line of evolution, the way people see it, how would we, have you ever thought about how we might end up a million years down the road? Uh, yes, frequently. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, if you go back a million years, we weren't that different, actually. I mean, we, we were, if you go back a million years, we would have been perhaps Homo erectus, um, archaic Homo sapiens. We'd have had um, somewhat smaller brains. Homo erectus had somewhat smaller brains. We walked upright. If you ask, if we go forward a million years, will we have our, our brains correspondingly bigger? Well, there's no particular reason to think that. Evolutionists very seldom get into the business of predicting what's going to happen in a million years' time. So I wouldn't do that. What I would say is that if you ask me what life's going to be like in, say, 10 million years or 20 million years, I doubt if humans will still be here, but what there will be is a whole lot of different species which will be doing pretty much the same thing as the present species are, but they'll all be different and pretty much the same thing as what was going on 10 million years ago, or 20 million years ago, 30 million years ago. But it'll be a different set. What you can predict is that there will always be a similar range of species doing a similar right. range of things. And that's a fascinating thought. But you can't right. predict in detail what any one species will be doing. Well, Professor Dawkins, I want to thank you very much for being with us, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us on the next show. Half a century after oil was discovered in Nigeria, we take a look at whether or not the $600 billion generated by its liquid gold has really improved the lives of its citizens. Join us as we talk with Nigerian Nobel laureate Wallace Oyinka. We'll see you next time.